Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. So, uh, so, so for the start of, of the uh, Trinity Term Lecture Series, uh, we've got a star speaker today. So we've got Chao Jing Wang from NYU. Uh, I'm sure many of you already know about his work. It's had an enormous influence. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I first became aware of some of Chao Jing's work many years ago. Uh, when I read about some of the neural network models that he devised uh, of uh, working memory processes and, and decision making. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, impresses many people is the uh, deep interest that he has in, in making the neural network models biophysically plausible. Uh, and then at the same time, he seems to take uh, uh, behavior uh, and cognition uh, in, in a very equally thoroughly um, impressive way. Uh, that's not all that he does. Uh, so uh, another side of his research is uh, about uh, the functional architecture of the brain and uh, uh, how it is that uh, hierarchies of activity or anatomy uh, might emerge across the brain. Uh, and it's uh, a part of this side of his research that he's going to be telling us a bit about today. So thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you, Matthew, for the kind introduction. Uh, I was told that I should tell you, especially students and postdocs, a bit uh, my trajectory. Uh, maybe I just mentioned that uh, I did go through a bit on your job path, uh, studying uh, in uh, physics as undergraduate. Uh, in fact, not far from here, very rarely speaking, so I, I came to Belgium and to uh, do my undergraduate studies in physics and then I stay there uh, you know for my PhD. Uh, so um, sometimes I joke that in one day uh, I switched the field, I changed the language, uh, I changed the culture and country. So that's when I uh, moved from uh, Belgium to the US and made a transition from uh, physics to neuroscience. Back then, computational neuroscience was very, very um, young, very, very new, and then switched the language from French to English. And so, you know, today is very different. Everybody, I hope, uh, in neuroscience uh, uh, realized that uh, theory and modeling uh, are useful. Somehow, there's some close collaboration with experiments. Uh, we will try to figure out how the brain really works as a complex system, especially across levels. Right? So if uh, any of you is interested in genomic data analysis, how do you really relate genes with um, behavior through recurrent neural circuits? Right? That, that, in my mind, is certainly one of the biggest uh, challenges in the field. Um, so, uh, I'd like to share with you a bit what we've been doing uh, in this um, park. Um, it's really, by the way, I really want to say that it's really a pleasure to be here because over the years we have been very much inspired uh, by the work and ideas coming from people in this audience and you know, uh, or who may not be able to make it. Um, uh, at Oxford, uh, I just had a wonderful conversation with Dick uh, Passingham. Uh, so it's really great to be here and meet with people in person uh, and, and then talk about topics of uh, shared interests. Uh, so what I would like to discuss with you is, is uh, our recent work that we um, carried out to investigate the question of um, if there is a canonical circuit organization across uh, the whole cortex, how does functional specificity emerge? Right? I'll explain to you how we formulate that problem and use multi regional large scale uh, cortex model to try to uh, you know, make progress in addressing this question. Uh, but before I actually get to that part, I thought it's useful uh, to spend a bit of time to summarize uh, our previous work on local circuit models and into the idea of what we call canonical type of microcircuits, and maybe 
uh, mentioned a few um, lines of research that were um, really inspired by the work of Mark Stokes here and to try to look at really the nature, the dynamical nature of working memory and district. Right, so that's the plan. A little bit summary of the previous work that uh, led us to look at the multi regional system. So uh, maybe some of you know that uh, you know for a long time we have been interested in asking what's special about say prefrontal cortex relative to primary visual cortex and say V1, right? That enables such a circuit to subserve cognitive functions. So imagine that you are you know, required to do this little task. Uh, some of you may have heard about uh, this uh, um, perceptual decision-making task by Bianu Sam, like Shatterley and others, um, and where you are shown a display of dots and your job is to judge the net direction of the moving pattern, upward A or downward B. And the task difficulty is controlled by the fraction of dots that move together, which can change from child to child from 90% all the way to 0%, right? And imagine that you are supposed to make a perceptual judgment about the stimulus and then hold in your working memory what was your choice in order to guide a later behavior response, right? Okay, and the kind of model, um, you know, um, that we looked at and others um, show this very interesting duality as illustrated by this two single trial simulations when the coherence is zero. The inputs are identical to the two uh, neuron pools. Uh, there are strong recurrent excitation between neurons within each neuron pool, uh, underlying what's called reverberation. Uh, and then there's competition between the two neuron pools, so shared inhibition, right? Okay. And so the duality is that on one hand, you have this very slow transient on the time scale of hundreds of milliseconds to a second that has been shown by Mike Shadron and others to be the neural correlate of temporal integration of evidence for different uh, you know, choice options, right? And on the other hand, uh, you see this uh, uh, winner-take-all uh, competition leading to a categorical choice. And in trial one, uh, neural group A in red wins the competition, and in trial two, neural group B blue uh, wins the competition. And it's, that is uh, realized by the so-called attractor dynamics, uh, which is also the same uh, mechanism that can hold the choice information when the input is gone, so a delay period, for example, uh, in, in memory. Um, so I guess this is one example uh, where we kind of focus on very basic uh, cognitive functions. In this case, um, this little circuit can uh, somehow um, capture you know, the basic processes, those for working memory and decision-making. And it allows you to think across levels, right? So across uh, many trials, you can compute the uh, accuracy function or the reaction time function as function of occurrence um, that emerges from those kind of stochastic population activity. And then on the other hand, you can also ask what's the mechanism that's crucial to give you this slow reverberation right, uh, on the line, this transient uh, remedy activity. And we in the model propose that that depends on the MDA receptors and the recurrent accessory synapses. And that very specific thing she can be tested experimentally. Now, um, this all happens, if you like, when the strength of the recurrent excitation within each neural pool is above the threshold, as shown here uh, in what we call a bifurcation diagram. Uh, so x-axis is just a parameter in the model that uh, controls the strength of excitation. And you see that the you know, functional uh, probabilities, if you like, uh, really happen only uh, when this value is above the threshold. Right? Uh, and that's a very general thing I'm going to um, elaborate when we talk about large scale multi-regional system, namely uh, some quantitative differences. In this case, the strength of excitation Think about B1 versus PFC, for example, could in principle lead to the emergence of new functional capabilities. And so that's the idea. We would like to, I hope, uh, show you some evidence for modeling at least so far uh, that can be extended from local circuit consideration to large scale systems. Now, 
This is sometimes is called attract network for uh, persistent activity, um, which has uh, been discussed extensively in uh, the last uh, decade or so. Um, you know, one of the very important contributor was uh, Mark Stokes. Um, and so um, there are many interesting discussions and research by various groups to, you know, um, really try to test um, to what extent we can understand the, uh, uh, the neural representation mechanism. I just would like to mention a few points uh, without showing details. Uh, if you are interested, take a look at this, this review. Um, so to start with, the attractive states don't have to be steady states. Okay, you have, uh, this state can be stochastic associations. It can be spatial temporal patterns. When that happens, you can have uh, windows of time when there's no activity, but the memory trace is still there which can be because you have slow AMD receptor conductance okay, that does not uh, decay away very quickly, for example, or it can be additional mechanisms, short of plasticity, right? Um, so you can have windows of time when there's no spikes, but the memory trace is not lost. The second uh, point to make is that um, in spite of fact, you have, uh, observed experimentally, a lot of heterogeneities across recorded neurons. And for a given neuron, you see very interesting temporal variations throughout the delay period. Um, those observations by themselves are not necessarily um, inconsistent with the fact that you can have stable coding in a subspace when you look at population activity, right? So if you look at population activity, rather than single cell, one cell at a time, you can uh, show that um, that uh, you could have a subspace in the uh, population activity state space in which the coding is stable and temporal variations actually happen in the orthogonal direction. Right? And the third point to make is that uh, uh, working memory by definition uh, in psychology by uh, Badley uh, involves not only maintenance but also manipulation of information, right? So one study by uh, Nick Mass, for example, trained a recurrent network to perform working memory dependent tasks. When you don't assume whether the problem can be solved either using persistent activity or using what's called activity silent state scenario. And what he found is that uh, if you need not only to maintain information, but also manipulate information, then persistent activity just emerges from training of the network which makes sense, right? You do manipulation and computation by spikes, right? Now, but in my mind, what really is interesting through this discussion is to really make us be aware that uh, there are limitations of thinking a local circuit like this, because we tend to think about this system as a closed system, a local circuit, which is not true in the real brain, right? There may be some intruding thoughts, there may be some you know, new cues, rule signals, uh, you need to update the storage uh, content, et cetera. So that's one um, we should think about, you know, the temporarily changing events and epochs uh, in real life. And frankly, I think that cannot be properly studied using the local circuit model. And that's one of the motivations, as I will show, why we started to uh, build local region tasks. But before that, maybe I should you have one slide to tell you a little bit about in parallel with our efforts to build large scale modeling, we also tried to uh, build local circuit models, or at least some circuit models for more and more interesting and complex cognitive building blocks, right? Uh, so for example, in this work, Robert Young, when he was a graduate student, trained a recurrent network to perform 20 different tasks. And that enabled us to start to ask about task representations in a single network and maybe how that can be used for rule-based switching. Um, another um, more recent study that just came out this month is to ask if you train a recurrent network to solve a series of uh, flexible, arbitrary sensory model mapping problems, um, 
is there something like schema automation uh, that means that you can build um, on what you have learned before to speed up learning, to solve the new problems, okay? And indeed, A, we found that, uh, you know, in this model, at least, there is a acceleration of solving new problems in a series of problems. And our collaborators, David Friedman and his colleagues, have shown that monkeys do the same. Uh, and secondly, we found in the model that that happens because there's a formation of a subspace uh, in the population activity uh, state space that may correspond to what uh, is defined as schema in some language. And that remains reused more or less environment across uh, problems. Right? And, and, and another example is economical choice based on valuation. And here we train the recurrent network to perform a uh, value-based economical ch uh, uh, choice task uh, by using a vanilla RNN and incorporating Dale's law, we hope that we can really try to understand a uh, certain mechanism of variation uh, in such a network. And uh, one more example is unkill rule-based task switching. Uh, I guess the familiar example would be Wisconsin task sorting test, right? Uh, you have to solve a problem by paying attention to say one of the uh, features in the stimuli and the rule changes unpredictably, right? So you have to configure out what's the kind of rule you play and then adjust and flexibly change the sensory motor um, you know, flow to solve the problem. And that involves some kind of grading based on the rule representation and randomness. Uh, I think we have made some progress to figure out how this kind of gating uh, takes place. That involves a uh, different cell types. Now, um, I'm sorry, I did not go into details. I'd be happy to uh, dive into more details uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, uh, just to mention that uh, um, gradually, hopefully, we can have some understanding about uh, building, blo building blocks of combination, which we hope down the road will be incorporated into the large scale uh, uh, multi regional model that I'm not going to talk to you about. Um, so, um, you know, this, of course, we know for a long time, but there's um, uh, increasing awareness and recognition that uh, cognitive processes may not be completely localized in a small piece of the cortex, for example, right? Even uh, when the uh, uh, content of working memory um, stored items are very simple, like the color or shape, apparently multiple brain regions are involved, as uh, summarized here for monkey and, and human studies. Uh, this is another example of decision-making from our middle slab uh, when they um, train the monkeys to do a context-dependent decision-making task uh, and recorded from six different brain regions, you see rather uh, you know, distributed signals, right? So, of course, this days, um, this, you know, the question of local versus global becomes more urgent because these days um, you can use uh, uh, not, not only imaging, but also say, thermal pixels to record neurons across many uh, brain regions in single trials. And uh, I think we have very little theoretical understanding about the general principles for distributing uh, processes. There's even a bit of confusing about whether distributed processes mean there's no specificity, right? And that's the kind of question we have to address uh, for the remainder. Um, so how do you go from the local system to large scale systems? We started with uh, a collaboration with Henry Kennedy, who about 10 years ago published uh, a um, database for macaque uh, cortical area to area connectivity metrics. I'm going to skip the details uh, of their method, just to mention that they had a way to actually use rather a traditional method, but in a very careful way, quantitatively measure weighted and directed connectivity. Okay, so 
So like your V1 to V2 is different from V2 back to V1. So you have a number assigned to uh, each directly uh, you know, connection path. And um, I will summarize two major findings. Uh, one is that the weights are very heterogeneous, spanning five order magnitude that can be fitted with a log normal distribution. And secondly, the connection weight for any pair of areas, A and B, decays exponentially with the wiring distance. What that means is that you cannot really think about a cortical network as a pure topological graph, right? We really should really take into consideration the spatial embedding, the spatial proximity, proximity of, of, of areas uh, in such a manner. So imagine that I take this connective matrix to build a multi-regional large scale model. Right? So you know, this is a given, right, for, for theories. Um, I guess uh, there are many questions, but one uh, important one is how do you describe each locus in the in your dynamic model, right? Um, of course, the answer would depend on the scientific question you would ask, and we want to do, uh, you know, go through this process step by step. We have multiple versions, if you like, uh, of uh, multi-regional models now. Um, the first one we, we uh, look at is to um, say, well, there's this very powerful idea of canonical circuit, right? Actually, uh, uh, to a large extent, um, uh, really uh, promoted by Ramin Douglas and David Martin while they were here uh, at Oxford. So the idea is that there is a you know a local circuit organization that's more or less the same as the whole that may be more or less the same even in rodents and primates to some degree. Uh was it more or less, I mean qualitatively, right? And now we know more and more about quantitative differences, right? But if you take that as um, you know the starting point, right? In a way, when people think about graph theoretical analysis. They kind of think about nodes as being the same, right, in the graph. And so it's kind of also uh, consistent with this, um, you know, um, premise. But then you ask, what will be, you know, the explanation for functional specificity, right? Again, think about the you know, cortex versus the UI. Well, part of the answer must be inputs and outputs. Right? You know, V1 gets very different input. Uh, and project in outputs uh, and then um, PFC. You know, some area make it a lot of input from amygdala, and that may be a big reason that that area is somehow more, more involved in emotion or body process. What I want to focus on for the rest of the talk is say, yes, that definitely is part of the answer, but it's not enough. Uh, and the uh, top of that, uh, I'm going to show you that uh, you also have quantitative variations of biological properties that are important for synaptic excitation and inhibition, right? And, and then quantitative differences, as I mentioned earlier, might potentially lead to what's called bifurcation automatically. And that could explain the emergence of a totally novel behavior in certain areas, but not in others. Right, so that's the idea um, we uh, thought maybe uh, worth pursuing and exploring in such a system. So what do I mean by biological uh, property variations? Um, I'll give you four examples, um, you know, uh, and, and summarize in this review. Uh, this first example is coming from Guy Elston, who counted the number of spines per piano cell. Uh, in macaque uh, monkey cortex in this example. As you know, there's only one excitatory synapse per spine, right? So the number of spines is kind of a proxy for the strength of excitation per neuron. And that turns out to be very different from V1 or V2 or V4. So if you plot the spine count per the cell as a function of the hierarchy, which is quantified by heterogeneity this group, then you see this, uh, what we now call a macroscopical gradient, right? Um, so it's not high-dimensional random variations, there's some kind of low-dimensional gradient. 
like the spine cuff. Another example is from John Murray's group. Uh, he looked at uh, gene expression data in human cortex. Uh, remember I said that NDA receptors with bubbles are important for regeneration, right? So this is an example of the gene expression um, of the gene that encodes uh, the protein, which is the NR2B subunit of the NDA receptors, right? Okay. Uh, and uh, what's shown here is the uh, gene expression um, as a function of the so-called uh, T1, T2 ratio that can be measured uh, structurally, which has been shown to be high in, in early sensory areas and low in higher association areas. So in a way, the hierarchy is going the other way, right? And you see evidence that, uh, you know, MDA um, related uh, gene expression increases over the hierarchy. Now, a third one, which I think is also very interesting, uh, as you know, one important um, property of cortex is the diversity of inhibitor neurons, right? Um, and um, there's this rather strong evidence that uh, you can um, look at the uh, PV labeling neurons that kind of control the spiking output of PMDA cells on one hand, and then uh, some other statin or carbally uh, positive neurons that uh, target dendrites of PMDA cells. So they're in a good position to gate inputs on the dendrites of PMDA cells. <laughs> so then you can ask, maybe different parts of the cortex have different needs for input versus output control, right? And so this is a, a study um, where they counted uh, the uh, you know, uh, garbage cells of different types. Uh, the black curve shows the, uh, sorry, it's kind of, uh, fuzzy, the quality somehow is not so nice, but I hope you can kind of see. Um, so the red, uh, which one, which is which? So the red is the uh, PV density uh, as function of different cortical areas. Um, and you see that there's a wide range, I hope you can see it. Um, uh, you know, uh, you tend to see um, sensory areas with a high PV density and association areas with a low uh, PV density. And in black, this is a rank order, is the ratio of PV divided by PV plus SST, right? So basically uh, you have more output controlling the neurons over here, and you have a lot more input controlling the neurons over there. Um, and it turns out that uh, sensory areas can be clustered here and association areas uh, on the other side. Um, and so this is another example of what we call microscopical gradient, uh, but for inhibition, right? And finally, this is a new study um, where we um, analyzed uh, data collected from the group of uh, Nicola uh, Palmero and uh, where they, um, they labeled and measured uh, the labeling density of receptors of different kinds, right? It turns out that the DUI receptor uh, labeling density shows this very nice gradient as function of the hierarchy. If you are interested in, say, dopamine modulation or reward uh, dependent plasticity, um, I think that this is useful to start thinking about how that may happen in a large scale modulation system. So imagine that we take those three, three things in the model, right? Number one, uh, we use the measured connectomic data uh, for the connective matrix. And number two, we use the same local circuit model, exactly the same mathematical equation for each of the local areas in the model. And actually we took uh, a model from the literature uh, published by Martin Douglas, uh, built on the V1 physiology. So you have really the commercial circuit uh, in the system. And thirdly, you introduce a gradient of say the strengths of excitation, right? Uh, say based on this type of measurements. Right? Um, so that constrain the model. So the model is built based on data. Um, and the first thing we observed is uh, what we call hierarchy of time constants. Um, so essentially, uh, if you look at the kind of uh, spontaneous activity, for example, in the model, uh, the fluctuations over which um, 
so the time scale in which fluctuations occur uh, is much faster for B1 than in, say, uh, areas. You can uh, uh, analyze auto correlation function of such a time series uh, and allow you to extract a time constant from each area. You usually see a, a increasing trend along the critical hierarchy uh, of this dominant time constant. Um, of course, you know, there are many interesting uh, you know, like complications, right? You can ask within each area, uh, is there diversity of time constants, et cetera. But I think the general trend of uh, time constants along the hierarchy um, is, um, you know, uh, has been tested uh, in particular by John Murray and, and the two uh, uh, groups. And I think uh, generally that's what you would see. And that's functionally desirable, right? So if you think about V1, you want the circuit to operate very quickly because the visual inputs change very quickly. On the other hand, when I talk about the gradual ramping activity in some higher areas underlying decision making, the time constant must be slow, must be long, right? Otherwise, you would not see this ramping activity. So somehow, this uh, gradient of time constants or hierarchy of time constants uh, emerge in, in, in this uh, method. Um, and then we say, let's use this kind of model, but now replace local circuit model by what I described to you at the beginning to look at distributed working memory, right? So now as schematic is shown here, same idea, right? Uh, canonical local circuit, then we need the same equations uh, yeah. for each local area in the model. And here you have again two selective neural pools, uh, A or B, and then there's competition, so we can pick neurons, right? Um, same circuit. Uh, but then the strength of excitation, for example, will change from area to area, right? So that's the same game here. So I'm going to show you this local circuit uh, bifurcation uh, diagram one more time. I want you imagine that. Um, you have many areas, but for now, they are not talking to each other, right? You disconnect them, okay? Um, and so each one then have a parameter, J, E, the strengths of excitation within each isolated area, right? Okay, if there's a gradient, then you'd say uh, each area has different J, E value, let's say um, maybe increases with the hierarchy. Does it make sense? So V, Y is here with this value of J, E, V4 is here with that value of J, et cetera. Does that make sense? And say the top one has a J value that we call J max, right? So the question is, where's J max in this diagram? Should it be above the threshold, right? They say, yeah, it should be because you see decision signals, working memory signals, say in areas at the top of hierarchy. But you do physiology from intact animals. Right? So areas are now isolated from each other in, in the behavior animals. So we really don't know if the signals you see are really locally produced. I personally have reasons we thought a lot, debated a lot in the lab, right? I personally think that there are areas that are capable of generating, uh, you know, working memory representation and, and, uh, and uh, carrying out decision combinations uh, locally, but we don't know yet. Right? So I, I think it's useful to uh, really think carefully and uh, look at different options, different scenarios. So you can put JMAX to be below threshold. In which case, in the intact connected system, whatever you see is not a local phenomenon, right? It's going to emerge from the interactions between the areas. That make sense? Uh, of course, you can also change your JMAX as a parameter in the model. Uh, to be near the threshold or about the threshold, right? Um, or about the threshold. So in this um, single trial simulation, um, I'm going to show you one example when JMAX is below the threshold. So what you see here is the emerging phenomena through the large scale interactive uh, loops. Okay. Uh, I perhaps should have mentioned that the connectivity you know, measured by Henry Kennedy's group 
is very dense. There are about 65 of all possible connections that are present. Right? So there are many different kinds of connection loops. So um, in this example, um, you um, give a very brief, brief input to V1 to simulate visual um, delayed response task. Right? You see that V1 responds very rigorously, but decays away as soon as the input is gone. It simulates the same gene in MT, uh, but in LIP, part of the posterior parietal cortex and some uh, frontal subregions, uh, the activity uh, is uh, self sustained when the input is gone. Right? Okay. Uh, if you plot the activity in space uh, during visual stimulation, the activity is uh, largely confined in the posterior part of the cortex. During the delay, in absence of stimulation, you have this sustained activity that's distributed, right? Uh, involving uh, different, you know, frontal, parietal, uh, and areas. So we would call this a spatially extended attractor state. Attractor simply means that it's relatively stable uh, against the small perturbations. That's all it means. Right. Um, you know, and we would like to understand how, you know, uh, to identify the underlying circuit mechanism that would uh, allow us to really uh, gain some general principle of understanding the distribution working on presentation. Um, interestingly, in the same system, without changing any parameter, you have many such uh, spatially extended states. Uh, here I'm showing you six different uh, examples. Each one is self-sustained and involving different subset of areas. Right? Some can be very local, right? Uh, and this is, a, I guess, um, one example in the model that you can have distributed working memory representation that's also showing uh, specificity, right? So this one is very specific about those two areas engaged in a particular internal state that's self-sustained. That's another one, right? Okay, and it can be more or less distributed, right, across different spatial attractive states. Um, I think this is actually very interesting for several reasons, uh, because after all, uh, whatever internally happening cognitive processes, may involve for, you know, a given task, different subset of areas, right? So potentially any of these could be interesting uh, for the distinct functions. Right? I just want to mention that uh, the same system uh, can have multiple uh, self-sustained attractive states that, uh, you know, show both distribution uh, representation and specificity. Um, recently, we also built a mouse cortex model uh, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, there are a lot more tools and there are a lot more data available for mouse as illustrated by this new data release. Um, what's, um, I guess, um, one of the things that may be different, there are many differences, I think, with mouse and monkeys, but, but uh, uh, one, you know, interesting difference uh, we uh, found in the literature is that there's no real strong evidence of spine count created in mice. Uh, that's shown here. Uh, so this group first replicated Elston's data from a cat monkey in red. Uh, so if you look at spine count, you know, um, for uh, PFC uh, in red, it's much higher than uh, V1 in pig, right? And then the same, group using the same method uh, in uh, spine count analysis for V1 and frontal area in mice, they didn't see any difference, at least uh, for this study. Um, so we don't really know if there are other forms of the um, you know, gradient of the strength of excitation in mice. You have some ideas or some uh, information of the topic. But we do know that there's a gradient of inhibition. So we thought, you know, maybe we could explore in the model that this would be sufficient uh, to uh, look at distributed 
uh, working memory representation of mice. Uh, the idea being very intuitively that PPMs are really crucial for controlling accessibility of a, a local circuit, right? So maybe the more PPMs you have, the less likely uh, you can have um, sustained activity in the absence of external inputs. That's the general idea. So um, she again uh, built uh, such a model based on connectomic data from uh, Judy Harris and others from the Allen Institute. And they also um, you know, quantified the hierarchy a bit like what Henry uh, Kennedy did for Macaque, which again is useful for us to get how things change uh, quantitatively along hierarchy. And here's a simple example, more or less using the same format as I showed you for the Macaque uh, codex modeling, uh, you know, uh, a delayed visual response task where you can input uh, V1, the mice model, and then you see that somewhere else showed you have to other stones like in mice. And if you plot the firing rate during the delay period, uh, as a function of the PV density, uh, you would get this uh, um, not very strong, but uh, clearly significant uh, negative correlation, right? Uh, so you would expect that uh, there's stronger, you know, um, inhibition, and uh, then it's less likely uh, that basically area will be involved in the maintenance. Right? That makes sense. Um, now, using the model, we start, especially for mice, right? Uh, in this case, you can do all kinds of interesting uh, manipulations. Uh, we thought we should uh, use this as a platform to, um, for example, ask, how can you identify certain areas that are at the core for working memory representation, right? Uh, so we classified four different kinds of areas. The other thing is different. Uh, don't see the colors of all different uh, area types. So maybe there's uh, something that changed from uh, Mac to um, this machine. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but but maybe I can still convey the genes, right? So um, so the first kind of areas would be uh, the ones like V1. Uh, depends on the input modality that is necessary for the input to get into the system, right? Uh, so that's not necessarily important, not necessarily important for working memory maintenance during the delay period, right? And the second one is just this one that doesn't do much. And the third one is an interesting one that may show delay activity that's, you know, stimulus encoding, but it's more like a readout by virtue of getting sustained inputs rather than uh, playing a major role in maintaining uh, uh, working memory uh, uh, itself, right? And finally, the fourth type would be the ones that are at the core, right? Through the loops, for example, they are really important maintenance of uh, information during working memory. And there are ways to um, really separate those four kinds of uh, uh, areas. Uh, if you could do appropriate uh, inactivation, say by optogenetic method. Uh, so namely, uh, uh, we we'll propose you can look at the effect of inactivation for one particular area during the stimulus presentation or during the delay period, right? So for example, if you look at this input area, the impact would be strong if you do inactivation during the stimulus presentation, but may maybe nothing when you do that during the delay. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, whereas if we do inactivation for this area, perhaps it doesn't do much for uh, the working memory representation. If that is uh, dependent on uh, those areas, right? And by contrast, of course, for those areas, if we do inactivation uh, during the delay, we will be working memory. Uh, the other thing we ask is, although we used connectomic data to build the model, can the connectomic data really predict the behavior? Right? And so we use all kinds of graphic as theoretical uh, measures that may be relevant to predict uh, persistent activity, right? So for example, you say, uh, if the loops are the ones uh, to maintain working memory representation. So for each area, 
and you ask, you know, how many loops are we involved in and what are the strengths, right, as a measure? Or just uh, what's the overall inputs to this area from the other areas? Uh, we tried all kinds of measures and one of them is eigencentrality. It's just one measure uh, for the inputs. We didn't find any correlation. And then we thought, in a way, it kind of makes sense. It's obvious, usually in science, when you, you know, struggle and they realize, ah, this must be the answer. Well, the answer is that the loops depend on the targets, right? So if you say reverberation is the one that maintains the business activity, well, if A excites B and B in turn excites A, then you have a loop. But if B excites inhibitory neurons in, in A, then you don't have E to E loop, right? Okay, so we really should care about, you know, the projection projecting to both E and I cells, what's the relative weights, right, of the projections that are cell type specific. So we modified the uh, graph stimulative measures by incorporating the target cell types. And then we see a very nice correlation between uh, a, a revised cell type specific measure and the say delay activity firing rate. Right? And um, so because that just suggests that uh, you know the left will have cell type specific kind of I think coming up uh, certainly in mice uh, you know very soon. There are already data now, but more will come out. Um, now, if I plot the fine rate during the delay period as a function of hierarchy, both for macaque problem and mice, um, you see that the areas that are engaged in working memory are separated from those that are not by a gap in the fine rate. Right? Okay. And that actually looks a bit like the bifurcation diagram I showed you uh, for the local circuit model where the x-axis was a parameter that you change by the model. Does that make sense? So um, let me just step back this a little bit uh, to say how no trivial this may, um, this actually is, even though this look maybe kind of uh, simple. Um, remember that this is all emerging phenomena, right? If you disconnect areas, nothing happens. So this has to be a collective behavior from this dense connectivity, right? 65% of all post connections uh, in the model, all kinds of loops that generate this um, you know, collective behavior. And yet there's a transition locally in space. Yeah. And so that's why I think it's a, a, a interesting example that you have a canonical circuit but you may also have the emergence of functional specificity kind of uh, working memory representation in this example. So is this some kind of bifurcation in space? Um, so um, I'm going to skip a lot of details. Um, actually, we have a, 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 a new paper to address this specific question, which is not trivial for many reasons. Uh, because if there's a transition, like a phase yeah. transition, you have to zoom in very closely and find the signatures for bifurcation, uh, and then do math to really uh, convince yourself there's a uh, bifurcation in mathematical sense. Right now, we are confident, you know, through this, uh, you know, mathematical analysis, uh, that it's <coughs> some kind of novel form of bifurcation that uh, happens in, in cortical tissue. Right. And it doesn't require any tuning of parameters. If you change any parameters, the location of this transition may change a little bit, but it's there, All right? Okay, and interestingly, if we now look at the time scale of fluctuations of neural activity, the bifurcation has a signature. Actually, if you're very close to the transition, the fluctuations occur over many different time scales. So essentially the time constant becomes infinite here, right? okay? Uh, and that's actually borrowed from physics. Uh, you know, they have this uh, word called the critical slowing down. For example, if you look at the transition from ice to water, they would see critical slowing down. Near the transition or right at the transition, everything 
happens on many, many different timescales. That's underlying what we call renormalization theory or fast transitions. So we say, do you have something really like this uh, in our model? Right? Um, and so we really, you know, this uh, over correlation function analysis of spiking activity in each area during the delay period. And we um, indeed found this uh, uh, inverted V shape pattern of time constants, right? And so near the transition, near the battery point, the time constant can get very long and uh, here, right? And so now those high, you know, in, uh, in the hierarchy actually show pretty short time constants during the delay period. And the same model, if you repeat the analysis at the rest before the stimulus is shown, you will produce this uh, more or less monotonic uh, pattern of time constants. Right? So the, um, the general point is that for a nonlinear dynamical system, the time constants are not uniquely defined. You have to say what internal state you are in, and then you define the time constants. So the new prediction from the bifurcation space idea is that at rest, you see a kind of monotonic, uh, more or less monotonic uh, trend for the time constants, but during the delay period, you'll see this in very huge shape of uh, time constants. The other thing, when you think about it, um, is actually quite intriguing. Namely, this is a defined for each attractive state, right? And I told you that the same system has many different attractive states. So if I did the analysis for another attractive state, I would see a different pattern, right? That would allow us to explain why certain areas selectively, specifically, are engaged in this particular attractive state for that particular uh, internal function, that internal cognitive function, and not others, right? So I think that's one general way of thinking, at least for us, how we can really uh, start to think about um, functional uh, specificity in such a system. Now, if I can, uh, Tim has a question, it looks like, but maybe we just hold off in two seconds uh, that, that I want to cover one more example. Uh, as you say, when we talk about local circuits, we feel like there's a shared you know, a mechanism for working memory distribution, right? And in principle, this kind of large scale system uh, should also be a platform to look at both distributed uh, decision making memory. So I want to share with you one last piece of uh, original research, um, you know, starting to address this question. Um, so you probably heard about this idea of uh, global workspace for awareness. Right? And you can actually study that uh, using rather simple uh, paradigm, right? So for example, if you show a visual stimulus and you adjust the contrast of the stimulus, such that you are, you start, you the contrast so low, but near the detection is special. Right? And then, you know, for the same physical stimulation of the retina, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't see it. And uh, people like Stanis Dehan and others, uh, found using the MEG recording or ECOG recording that when you say you don't see it, the signal is mostly confined in the ventral part of the cortex. But when you say you see it, you're aware of the stimulus, um, PFC is let up, and then which quote unquote in their language broadcasts the signal to the rest of the brain, right? So we wonder if we can use our kind of model to start to look at something like this. More specifically, uh, we focus on this monkey experiment uh, where they did exactly that kind of detection task with monkeys. Uh, so you have four kinds of trials, right? Uh, when you show the stimulus near spectral uh, contrast, either there's a hit or there's a miss. But because the contrast is so low, occasionally they didn't show stimulus, right? And in that case, most of the time, the animal said, I don't see the stimulus, but occasionally monkey would say, I see it, even if there's no stimulus presentation. So you also have, you know, in absence of stimulation, 
little correct rejection for, for Salah, right? Now, what they found essentially is that B1 and B4 neurons more or less reflect a physical stimulation, right? Of heat and mist channels. The activity is high for a correct rejection of the alarm channels, the activity is very low. But in DLPFC, you see a very different pattern, right? So, you know, in the heat trial, the activity is very high in green. In mist trials, the activity tried to go up, but it's not sustained, eventually it dies out. Um, when you don't show the stimulus, uh, there's not much in force, uh, sorry, in, in correct rejection trials in black, but in the false alarm trials, they saw this kind of growing activity more or less to the same level as the heat trials. Um, so we applied our model with one major uh, you know, extension to this task. So um, the, the major extension is to uh, design, actually based on, uh, based on some measurements, uh, the MDM per ratio at different pathways. So you want the feed forward projections to be very quick, mostly mediated by ampere receptors, which are very fast, and then the local recurrent connections and the feedback top-down projections have um, a bit more than the receptors, as shown here by two pairs of projections, right? And it's all small, right, uh, in terms of NDA component, but a bit more for V2 to V1 than V1 to V2, or, or for uh, PFC to LIP compared to LIP to PFC, right? This is the main change we made for the large scale uh, multi regional chemical codex model. And um, the model indeed can capture the salient physiological observations. Uh, here, the model compared to the vertical uh, measurements, as well as the convergent function as shown here compared to the monkey behavior, um, namely the uh, detection uh, you know, beside the social contrast. Now, there's one prediction, uh, it, namely in the mis, in, in the false alarm trials. Um, in fact, if you look at the individual uh, trials, you don't see the ramping activity as shown here in blue. Instead, you see jumps as shown here, vaguely, maybe with six trials, you see the switching of activity from low to high, uh, but that switching time occurs randomly over uh, trials. So if you do the trial average, you would get a ranking uh, added. So that prediction can be tested, uh, I guess, for further uh, data analysis. So in a way, if you think about this, right, you can also ask when the switching occurs, where does it happen first? In the large scale multi-regional system, uh, in some sense, it's like a bifurcation in space and time, right? And then you can also ask new questions like, what really controls force alarm rate? Are there some localized areas in the large scale system that are especially important for determining the rate of force alarms, right? Which is like, you know, hallucination, if you like, right? So um, I, I think this is again, uh, just the beginning. Uh, our, our hope is that, uh, uh, you know, at the same time, we build connectomic based large scale model and, you know, talk to experimentalists to uh, look at the distributed uh, processes and look at some predictions for the models, especially this V uh, shape pattern time constants and maybe, uh, you know, bifurcation in space and time. And at the same time, if we know more how to build building blocks of cognition at a certain level for more and more complicated processes, then we'll incorporate them into the large scale model, right? And the two will actually converge. So we can have a platform to look at uh, you know, more and more interesting cognitive processes. So um, maybe one simple take home message. This is, I have to say, limited, right? So this is just, uh, uh, one way to start to think about how functional specificity can be um, understood, even though there is a canonical circuit organization 
And on top of that, you have microscopic gradients of properties and bifurcation that leads to qualitative change or transition, right? Um, and of course, there are many things you can ask, right? And again, we'll go back to inputs and outputs, right? Uh, maybe if you really want to understand um, certain unique abilities in humans, we don't know if there are other things we want to think about, like some mutation or some really uh, sudden changes. Um, but um, I guess this is one way certainly uh, I think will be important to consider um, uh, when you think about uh, this type of systems. Let me thank people who uh, contributed to the work I shared with you and thank you for your attention. So um, we've got a bit of time for questions, but I, I realize there might be a few people who have to leave. Uh, so, so if you do need to leave, now's the time to do it. Okay, uh, any, any, any time for this? So I guess one, one thing I was going to ask is um, on the slide that uh, uh, looked like there was a sort of map PC uh, conversion problem, you were talking about the different uh, types of uh, working memory process. You were talking about uh, a sort of readout process and you were distinguishing it from uh, some other core uh, working memory process. And then you, as far as I could see, you were relating that to different patterns of activity and to different brain areas. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on that distinction that you were making and maybe explain how uh, how you could see that difference if you were trying to, to test for it in a, um, by looking yeah. at activity patterns. What would be the right. signature so, for each so the, the, the scheme I showed is, of course, simplistic, it's a scheme. And there mm -hmm. you have an area that uh, receives inputs. Let's imagine, right, that, uh, you know, but this is actually that stores working memory is produced by a subset of areas, which in turn project to some other areas, just for the sake of the discussion. Then you would see delay activity in those areas, but not because they are crucial for maintenance, it's simply because they receive inputs from uh, the other areas, right? Uh, maybe for functional reasons, or, you know, uh, we don't know. But that can happen, right? If that happens, it's useful to ask, can I identify core areas experimentally? Mm -hmm. right? So in principle, yeah, if you say optogenetically inactivate neurons in the uh, kind of follower, right? Uh, the activity will be gone during the delay period in, in follower. But the overall representation of working memory <coughs> will not really be damaged. Right, in principle. But if you do the same thing with the core areas, you would see really impaired performance. Right? So the key difference would be one that you would be able to test by inactivating. So there wouldn't be a difference in the pattern of activity that you would see. That's a good question. I, we have not really looked at too closely about this. Uh, it could be you'll see signatures. Uh, we don't know. Actually, um, I quickly mentioned, for example, um, you know, oscillations have been a topic uh, in, in this field. Um, usually strong recurrent loops very naturally give rise to oscillations because of the feedback interruptions. Uh, and so I just speculate, actually the followers perhaps would have different fingerprints uh, if, you know, area is not really a core part of the loops. Um, I just speculate uh, we, we should look at this closely. For example, there could be some differences just by looking at uh, neural activity patterns, but we don't know yet. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. It's amazing to try and see um, uh, what what the local circuitry turns into when you multiply that. Um, I, I had no idea why the gradient disappeared in. One in one particular part. Why the 
gradient of time constants suddenly um, disappeared. I understood that it was an emergent property of the network, but I had no intuition of why. Um, uh, do you have an intuition of why uh, uh, the highest areas suddenly have short times constants during the delay period? It, it's not so much disappeared, but uh, somehow it's changed, right? But um, the areas at the top of the <coughs> gradient no longer have an lo integrate for the longest amount of time. Some yeah, so the, area the, the, the biological property needed. So the, the interesting thing is that the biological property gradient is anatomical, quote yeah. unquote, right? So it's always the same like this, Yeah. right? But during the delay period, uh, actually, uh, maybe I can, I can say two things, but mainly you could say, when you're near a transition point, somehow the fluctuations occur on multiple time scales. That's how you see actually an increased estimated time constant from areas near the transition. Oh, I see. So it's not actually because it's holding it. It's because there are long periods of time between the times when it goes up. So it goes up, and then it's down for a long time, and then it goes up, and that looks like a very long autocorrelation. Is that what no, saying? no, no, no. No, the activity is just ongoing yeah. during the delay period. But, but the, the, the time scale over which the fluctuations occur actually is not given by one time constant. You could think about somehow, especially when you get closer to, closer to transition, in principle, if you could, if you can find a way to do that, uh, you actually see a mixture of longer and longer time constants near the transition. Um, in, in a way, I wonder if it's re related to the observation that perhaps uh, during working memory and decision making, uh, PFC areas really act a bit more like winner take all, but some other areas, perhaps LIP and parental areas, are more kind of gentle and integrating to integrate the information. Right? There's a discussion about whether accumulation of information and we take off really occurs only in one area or there's a bit of a division of labor right between areas. I, I wonder if that is really uh, related to the supply so, so it depends on the task, depends on the, the internal state, uh, in, even in a given behavioral epoch. So that's shown here, right? Resting state is different from behavior. So in different epochs, where you didn't behave the paradigms, actually the need for different time constants may change. Uh, and, and maybe this actually is what functionally uh, desired. Your mind, the need is not in any role in your model. I thought yours is purely a diversical model. So you're just saying it's a consequence, it's somehow a consequence of the of the biology that happens rather than rather than anything. Yeah, and then you could say you could use this long time constant for time integration. Right, uh, so then maybe that happens more in, in the areas near the transition. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks. I was wondering how some of these changes across the hierarchy that you were describing might relate to the sort of increase in sparsity of coding that you also see in these higher curricular areas. Because I've, I've always thought of sparse coding in, in the fall that of, you know, you have an increased complexity of receptive field in sensory regions, and so you get less ideal stimuli to drive them. But now you've got me thinking that maybe some of this increased in sparsity of coding can fall out of this, you know, differences in dopamine modulation and fine power. Yeah, so certainly, um, you know, the current setting of the model is not appropriate to address your question. You yeah, think about sparse coding, say, in IT versus early visual area, for example, is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the way, we, uh, you probably heard the idea of mixed selectivity in PFC. When we look at that, we actually found that dense uh, coding is needed, is better for, for you know, uh, PFC. Uh, no, well, I basically don't have much to say about, um, uh, you know, great changes along the visual pathway, for example. Um, so just to mention that um, one of the ongoing projects in the lab is to enrich representation in each area. And so we can study ventral pathway 
about octane, uh, you know, the resolution and those are the best way about uh, spatial information processing. So maybe, uh, you know, we can think about the version of the model to look at that. Thank you. There was another question. You had a question? Oh yeah, maybe you can start first, Daniel. Um, yeah, yeah, I was uh, interested in the comparison between the mouse and the primate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't really read really the x-axis, but but it looked like there were a lot of areas sort of below the, the cusp point of gap in the mouse compared to the primate. But what's the homology there? Is it a gap that is a homologous position in both species, and we just have more areas with persistent activity in the primate, or are there some areas which are, have persistent activity in the primate but not in the mouse? So the exam, you know location of the transition yeah. really depends on the parameters. Right. So that does depend on the parameters, but the phenomenon itself is robust. Um, it actually, um, I think it's based on anatomic data. Uh, people think that there are, in fact, denser connections in mice right. cortex, and also the hierarchy is shallow right. in mice. So I would imagine, in fact, the more areas are blocked, in mice uh, cortex in general um, for a particular you know process. Um, but you got an impression of the opposite by most plots. Uh, yeah, yeah, they are maybe I can spread the graph, but it just it just looked like there's much more even splits in, in the mouse. So I wondered I, I guess I just wondered what, what the homology between the points on the x-axis was. Yeah, it, it's a not so obvious to really map out to get into it. You had a question, Nick? I did, yeah. So, um, I mean, so it's amazing you can capture so much of the dynamics like what's being made by the constraints in the network. But I wonder, you know, the other way in which biological networks and artificial networks differ is the organization of representational content. And presumably your model gives you an ideal tool to investigate whether that sort of allocation of representational content to different parts of the network whether that falls along similar lines to those we're familiar with in rodents and monkeys. And I wondered if you'd started to explore that. So, so allocation by attention, so yeah, yeah, so by behavioral from, needs. Yeah, so mm -hmm. for, you know, kind of like the, the different sorts of selectivity that you get, the different variables that are encoded, whether in a mixed or in an unmixed way. Is the representation of content in this network or what you mean? Have you got, so, know? yeah, so right now, um, Again, really the exact model we should use depend on the questions. And now we are limited to a very simple situation where you have at least two selective neural foods per area. But as I was mentioning, uh, with like new versions of the model, now you have much richer representation. Uh, you have any number of selective neural foods per area, and you can also have differences between discrete item representation, for example, versus continuous spatial representation in a bunch of versus those patterns. And then, uh, you know, eventually we want to build in rule representation, we want to build in reward uh, values representation in such a model. And then maybe that's needed first to uh, uh, address your question. Exactly, I was thinking about these very simple variables. Yeah. You've yeah. already modeled to us this data, right? So this really you know, kind of that's a detection task, but then the next time, the next step is then you have a discrimination task, and then you have representation content with A or B. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm I was wondering about the hemispheric visualization. <laughs> so, even though we had a similar uh, and types between the, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain. Of, of the brain. Uh, we have different representations. For example, some uh, aspects of, of, of the language is more represented on the left hemisphere and how much space mm -hmm. in the web. So what could be the reason? 
Yeah, I, I don't think we have anything to say about that for now, <clears throat> at least. Uh, and you can think about the model I described to you as only one side, whatever that side is. <laughs> um, no, we don't have a lot of ideas about that. Thank you for asking. Thank you. My, my question is kind of related to Chris's, which is, do you think that people who are building purely artificial networks of cognition are just interested in, in that for that sake, have anything to learn from a brain um, and what the kind of principles that, that are emerging um, from, from your models? So I guess one question would be like, is, is the macroscopic organization that you're seeing and modularity uh, necessarily consequence of, of biological constraints in terms of you know, wiring the, well, the cost of, um, of wiring up the brain in a biologically constrained manner, or that there are computational benefits from having something that's structured in that way that you wouldn't get like a purely all to all connectivity. Yeah, that, I guess it's a, a very broad question. Uh, how do you compare right, uh, connectome based computational models of the brain versus uh, um, convolutionary or deep neural networks trained by uh, machine learning tools? Um, so, there are a number of things we can discuss. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, we can discuss offline more, more. But uh, I guess the main thing is, um, for example, uh, I really think that uh, hierarchical time constants, which is one result of the gradient, uh, could be functionally useful, right? When you think about, say, video prediction, um, we really predict what's going on when you are watching a movie, for example, because you kind of have some temporal windows about what happened before, right? That temporal context uh, would uh, help us to predict what's going to happen next, right? And we suggest this uh, hierarchy of time constants is one necessary, uh, you know, ingredient, right? And that allows you to really integrate information over time. And that temporally integrated information provides the context through the feedback projections to say science areas so in order to better predict what's going to happen next. So th th this will be one example. Very good. One is a much more speculative question. I just um, wondered about your information on learning space along this time scale might be integrated. So at least when we look at it at address in the Mark Hart in the process that we show uh, from John Murray and other, it seems always it to see it at the top where. Uh, and some of us here are interested in more interior as uh, needle responsive areas, for example, you know, French needle or anterior needle or like a tongue, maybe. And if we could record everywhere in the human brain, is there a reason you think the ACC would have to swap place or would it stay at the top of the hierarchy? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, gives me the opportunity to mention that, in fact, uh, the model right now we have for macaque is limited to a subset of areas uh, because that's what we have for connectomic data. So Henry Kennedy's group continues to do this, this kind of analysis. So hopefully we will have data for the whole um, complex. But for now, it's really a subset of areas. So it really is a, it's not a whole thing yet. Um, you asked about a human. Um, I guess, um, One thing that maybe is worth mentioning, you probably, you're not studying language, are you? Yeah. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning is the work by Yuri Hansen. So they look at, say, using you know, MEG or recovery brains with humans uh, processing you know, language information. They actually say that for areas that are involved in language processing, you also have a hierarchy of time constants that makes sense, you know, if you think about understanding words on very short time scales, and then you have to integrate words into phrases, from phrases to sentences to narratives. That'll be one example of time constants. Perhaps more generally, uh, there's something going on in the auditory stream. 
uh, and, and um, I do not know that ACC has to be uh, the one that shows the longest time constant. Um, so it, it's going to, you know, uh, still be an open question for further research. One question from somebody online. Yeah, Jim, maybe we can make this the last one. Uh, and so it's somebody asking about um, uh, the qualia of consciousness and uh, how that relates to the ignition process that you're describing. So I think they're asking. Qualia. Yes. Yes. How can you can you uh, link those phenomena at all? I I don't think I have anything to say about that. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so I guess people will actually distinguish right access to awareness from something like qualia uh, in, in the research of consciousness. So this is really a simple form of awareness that in principle can be studied using very simple lines. Well, maybe when you've solved consciousness, you can come back and <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, Shanjay. <laughs>